But the point is, we're not ashamed of the gospel. Right. We don't, we don't, we're, we're not there as secularists. Right. We're not there as Democrats. We're not there as Republicans. We're, we're there as people who fight for life. That's the voice of Bishop Patrick Wooden, an influential pro-life leader and senior pastor at the Upper Room Church in North Carolina. During our recent Virginia March for Life, he gave an unforgettable challenge to churches on why they must urgently speak up for the unborn in this culture. Welcome to Speak Up Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman, with our president, Victoria Cobb. Well, I cannot wait for us to share Bishop Wooden's talk this week because he gave just this amazing speech to pastors who were participating in our Virginia March for Life. And I got to tell you, when I heard this, I just, it really gave me chills because it's one of those things that is hard hitting, but also personally convicting. Uh, but before we get into that, I do just want to give a quick shout out to tune in next week because the session, you know, will be wrapping up or already wrapped up. And we are going to give you some very important insider updates on what happened, the final outcomes from the General Assembly. So make sure you tune in next week for that. And I, and I want to say before we get into this speech that I just really hope people hear this and they share it with their pastor because this is what pastors need to hear. We desperately need this voice of, as you said, conviction, but just uh, he tells it like it is. He's willing to say the hard stuff. He's willing to take on the hard labels that pro-life pro-lifers get and and he speaks just straight talk straight to the point and very very powerful and I think we need to kind of get to the point where we don't care what kind of labels are put on us and even our pastors need to hear that we need to speak the truth no matter what yeah so it's it's a really frank yet compelling talk um, and before we play this for you let me just give a little bit of context on who he is um, as I mentioned, Bishop Wooden is a nationally recognized pro-life leader. He's been senior pastor at the uh, Upper Room Church in North Carolina for more than 30 years. And he has this great ministry called Happy Warriors, where they go out and do evangelistic ministry at the local abortion clinic. And you'll hear him talk about that. Um, now, there's part of the audio here that you're not going to uh, hear the first part of how he set this up. And so let me just quickly tell you that he is referring to Second Samuel uh, chapter 10, he, you know, he started off reading from that chapter. And that's where you'll remember that King David sends high level emissaries to comfort these foreign princes who had recently lost their father, who apparently the dad had helped David out at some point in his life. And uh, King David wanted to show compassion. So he sent these emissaries. And instead of diplomatically receiving this well intended compassion, these spoiled princes reacted with suspicion and pretty much publicly shamed and dishonored these emissaries. So that's where this talk picks up. So without further ado, let's hear Bishop Wooden. I want to talk to you just for a few uh, minutes uh, from this subject. They misrepresented us. And this means war. They have misrepresented us. And this means war. What am I speaking of? When Nahash died, and apparently Nahash was kind to David when David was on the run for Saul, from Saul, because when Nahash enters into the scripture, um, according to 1 Samuel chapter 11, he was Saul's first enemy. And they battled, and Saul defeated him. Uh, Saul tried to uh, make a, um, a covenant with him, and he wouldn't have it. Apparently, when David was on the run from Saul, when Saul was basically, had basically lost his mind and he was obsessed with destroying David, uh, Nahash was good to David. He did something for him that David remembered. In chapter 9, David used his, uh, his position as king to um, remember the house of Saul. He asked if there was anyone living of the house of Saul and found out that, yes, Jonathan's son, uh, Mephibosheth, was still alive and that uh, uh, he was crippled in his feet and David 
got him out of the loaded bar and said, you will eat, you will spend the rest of your days at my table. Chapter 10, we find David using his position again, not for war, not to shrink someone's life, but to try to uh, enlarge it by showing condolences. Uh, Nahum had just lost his dad, now he's in charge, and so David wants to do something good for him. And after he sends his emissaries to help, they began to color them incorrectly. They began to question their motives. It's about like what they do, what they do to us. Mm. What do they say about pro-life people? Pro-life people are pro-birth, but they're not pro-life. In other words, we're, one, we're the one and done crowd. We only care about kids who are in the womb. That's really what they say about white pro-lifers, that you guys really don't care about the little poor black babies after they're born, but you fight for life while they're in the womb. So you guys are the one and done crowd. They say that we're being paid off. I didn't know anybody ever got paid for this kind of work. I've never been paid. I thank God, I thank God for uh, at our, our local church, at the at the clinic where we fight, business is down uh, tremendously. Uh, they can't keep a doctor, uh, you know, because the doctors don't come for free. And um, uh, many days now, the clinic is closed when we first uh, begin to show up. The, the parking lots were filled, and, and 25 cars or so were waited, waiting. You would think that they were serving food. They were killing babies. And we showed up with our group called the Happy Warriors. They'll be at the march today. Yes. And uh, they, we began to do something simple. Just stand there on the grounds and preach. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we found out that they could hear us in the clinic because people who lived in the apartments on the other side of the clinic began to come to the clinic and complain that we were making too much noise. So I said, well, praise God. So that means that uh, they can hear us on the inside. And let me tell you something. There's nothing like seeing a human being, a lady who was on the table about to have an abortion. She gets up and she walks out and she gives us a thumb up, a thumbs up because she decided to keep her baby. Some 33,200 or more babies are uh, little toddlers. They're probably pulling everything down, uh, tearing up things, making a mess. The little pet pitter patter of little feet, but they're alive because of the warriors. And you know what they did? They built a fence in front of the clinic to block us. But they made a mistake. They left the, you, know, you got to be able to drive in the parking lot. So Deacon, uh, uh, Superintendent Ward, we figured that if you stand at a certain position, and if you preach toward the clinic, our voices will hit the clinic, go back and hit the wall, and come back, go back uh, to Amplified. So they gave us a microphone, and that really increased our effectiveness. But the point is, we're not ashamed of the gospel. Right. We don't, we don't, we're, we're not there as secularists. Right. We're not there as Democrats. We're not there as Republicans. We're, we're there as people who fight for life, and oh, you should hear the things that they say uh, we blacks we're called tokens we got a whole lot of tokens in the room today yeah we're, you know we're the useful idiots so you white guys you don't care about babies you only care about them while they're in the womb the blacks we're tokens we are useful idiots we don't understand reproductive justice what do we hear? It's a Republican agenda. Uh, that we are against women's rights. Um, that we are against body autonomy. You hear all of the things. Uh, that we are against our own race. How can you be against your own race wanting your race to be born? I mean, how can you be against your own race? The, the first civil right is the right to be born. Forget the rest of them if you don't get born. How are you going to sit at a lunch counter if you're not born? How do you get equal access? How do you get uh, uh, equity and equality? You know, all of these woke things they're talking about now. How do these things apply to someone who's not born? Yes, sir. How can you be a preacher? Not speak up for life. That's right. That's right. That's right. Don't get me started. <laughs> uh, I, this is, I, I take this personally. Yes, sir. Since uh, Roe v. Wade was uh, made law, our people, our people, black people, African Americans, um, 
there are approximately 50% fewer of us than there would be had Roe never been long. I don't agree with Ruth Bader Ginsburg on much. But she was right when she said we went too far with Roe. And then she revealed something. Maybe, maybe her condition was dealing with her mind. She said, I thought when we passed Roe, we wanted to get rid of people that we didn't want to have too many of. In 73, the two dominant races in the country were white and black. Right. Now, who do you think she was talking about? Yeah. That they wanted to get rid of yeah. uh, the people that they didn't want too many of. Yeah. That was designed to eliminate us. Right. Yeah. Reverend Jesse Jackson in the 70s was our most powerful voice, uh, working with Miss Ruth Graham for life. Until he decided to run for the presidency of the United States, yeah. the Democrat Party told him to, to get our money. Yeah. Okay, change that, yeah. and he changed it. He sold us out. Yeah. And babies, well, we've been slaughtered uh, ever since, and they tell us that we're against our own race. They even accuse us of hating women. We're terrorists. They call us. We don't want. We don't want women to have health care. If if abortion is health care, then uh, pregnancy is a disease. It's natural for a woman to get pregnant. Killing a baby is not providing health care. You all, we all know that. We really don't care about babies. We're trying to tell women what they can do with their own bodies. There are multiple laws that tell you what you can and cannot do with your own body. Go over there and just walk up to a uh, stranger and slap him with your hand. Your hands are part of your body. See what will happen. <laughs> there's, there's much that governs what we can do. Thanks for joining us for Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. If you're enjoying the show, help us encourage others to speak up by giving us a five-star review and sharing it with friends. Thanks for listening. We're harming women. That's not true. And, uh, and you have examples yourself. I love this when they call us fools. That's exactly what they did with David's emissaries. Come on, sir. Mm -hmm. They were sent to comfort him. Right. Mm -hmm. They were sent to say the king sends his condolences. We want to do what we can to help you through this most difficult time. You are a new king. You just lost your dad. You're still, in, you're still bereft. But there is a king who sees and he loves you because your daddy was kind to him. And they began to talk and began to impede their intentions and to come against their motives just as they're coming against us today. But I love what David did and I love the way he responded. He understood that I, I can't let this stand. We can't let them color us wrong. We can't let them define us. We can't allow them to tell people who we are and what we believe. See, I believe this preachers, pastors in here today, that has never before. We got to speak up. We got we to gotta speak up. Um, this is not a day, and uh, I, you know, I don't, a lot of people have trouble with me on this, but this is not a day for a, a timid preacher. My position is if, if you're timid, you're afraid, go do something else. You know, there are many jobs for timid people. The pulpit is not one of them. We need preachers today who will just stand and say what needs to be said, motivated by love, yes. but love is not always uh, revealed or translated or revealed in soft tones. Right. Yes, sir. Love makes you angry. I have three wonderful grandchildren. My son-in-laws uh, are here and I love when I talk about my grandchildren, I love mentioning my son-in-law. That'll dawn on some of you next week <laughs> because you know in, in our community sometimes when you hear about grandchildren and if you don't mention son-in-law the assumption is yeah. right. the assumption is that uh, they're not legitimate and God loves all children but the point is uh, my daughter was married she got married at 26 years old Walk, she walked down she loves Jesus she walked the aisle in a white gown and it meant something right. <laughs> it meant something I have seen my grandchildren maybe about to touch something hot or to do something that would be bad for them. And I said, John Jr., stop! I had to freeze him. Because if my tone is soft, it may not get his attention. 
We've got to tell the world, stop. This, this, this worshiping of the god Molech, yeah. this killing, it shedding innocent blood, taking the lives of people um, for, own, for our own personal advancement. At least four or five elected officials uh, last year, had they, they actually came out and said that, you know, uh, I had an abortion and I'm in Congress. And they put their pictures out there. Is that not Molech, the God of convenience? You sacrifice your child so that you can make your own life better. David said, we've got to do something about this. And he called on Joab and Joab came up with a battle plan. And I love what he said. And he said, if the battle gets too hot for me, you guys come and help me. And if the battle gets too hot for you, I'll help you. And that's what we got to do. We got to build these networks, build these connections. And when we hear that our brothers and sisters are uh, under fire, we pray for each other and we come to each other's rescue. We do what is necessary to win. And lastly, he said, be of good courage and let us play the men for our people. Brothers, men, David said it's time for all of the real men to step up. Amen. And let's show ourselves strong. Now, our opponents are strong and they're loud and they're boisterous. And they're trying to make wimps of us. But you can't make wimps of pro-life people. Pro-life people are people who realize that in some ways we're already dead. I, I was at the clinic one day and the guy said to me, man, I'll take, I'll pull my knife out and I'll kill all of you all here. And I said to him, I'm already dead, my brother. I'm crucified with Christ. Yeah. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. This is the extent that we've got to be willing to go to save lives. And then when God is finished with us, somehow, some way, I don't know how he's going to do it. He'll take us home. But I, I want to go, I want to go with my boots on. Yes, I don't want to leave here, praise God, somewhere in the corner, in the corner, cowering down, and hoping that I don't get the devil's attention and, and oh, if I don't bother him, he won't bother me. No, we're called, we're called to put the kingdom of Satan on the run. We're, we're, we're called, amen. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. The church. It's not that they are uh, uh, on the offensive and we're on the defensive. We're on the offensive. Yes, sir. And they're on the defensive. God, in Jesus' name, I pray for every man and every woman in this place who understands the sincerity and the severity of this day. Who understand that if we don't speak up, motivated by love, motivated by Proverbs, we are called to be the voice for the voiceless. We are called to speak up for those who have been assigned death. I pray, oh God, that you would send revival as never before. I pray, God, that we burn with the fire of the Holy Ghost, the fire of the Holy Spirit, to declare that this wickedness is wrong and that we put an end to it in the name of Jesus we thank you for the legislative victories that we've had thank you for what the Supreme Court did but now Lord we come for the hearts of men and the hearts of women and we pray oh God that you would use us in these last days or as we say in these last and evil days to do the work of the Lord. And Father, through us, do what seemeth good in your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Wow, it's just so refreshing to hear someone so bold, so unapologetic about what he believes and unashamed of that. And it was a great call to action for the churches to not remain silent anymore on this issue. Yeah, I just so appreciated that he, that comparison that he made to David's em emissaries and just the way that they were mistreated and really the way they were mischaracterized, I thought was so powerful because 
We are out there trying to save babies and we get called every name under the sun and get completely distorted of what we're trying to do. And and his point was carry on, you know, his point was that we're still called to, to be out there and to be faithful. And so I just I just thought that was extremely powerful. Um, so I guess with that, we'll just say make sure to tune in next week, though, because you're going to get to hear this awesome wrap up. I hope it's awesome. We hope it wraps up in a really <laughs> positive way um, about the General Assembly and get to hear kind of where we stand at the end of the 2023 General Assembly session. Thanks for joining us for this week's Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. Visit us at familyfoundation.org. That's familyfoundation.org. See you next time. And don't forget, we are stronger when we speak together.